Our quote of the day is, uh, gas prices are so high that even Tom Brady has to go back to work. There was a, a group of bricklayers who were fixing up the convent and the mother superior told one of the sisters to make lunch for them and take it out to the hardworking men. But before she was to give them lunch, she should at least test their knowledge of religion. And so the nun made the lunch and carried it out to the workers. And she came up to one of them and said, my good man, do you know Pontius Pilate? And he thought about it for a moment and says, hmm, Pilate, hold on a second. And he yelled up to the co-worker on the scaffolding. He said, Frank. Frank said, yeah. Do you know a Pontius Pilate? He said, no, why? And the fellow down below says, his wife is here with his lunch. Today we have an episode that occurred in the life of Pontius Pilate where he massacred a group of Galileans that had come down to the festival to offer their sacrifices in the temple. Now, as we know from the historian Philo, Pontius Pilate was a cruel, brutal man. He governed Jerusalem for 10 years from 26 AD until 36 AD. He was the sixth procurator of Jerusalem. He was on the outpost of the Roman Empire. It was a very undesirable job to have. And so Pilate was not often happy in his job. He would often do things to offend the Jewish people that he governed in Jerusalem. For example, putting up images of the emperor and other Roman statues throughout the city of Jerusalem, which offended the Jewish faith and the Jewish religion. He, at one point, he even took money from the temple treasury and he built an aqueduct in Jerusalem with the money from the temple treasury. And so apparently, on this occasion, one of the current events that happens is that some people came up to Jesus and said, Lord, did you hear about the massacre where Pilate massacred these Galileans? So much so that even their own blood was mingled with the blood of the sacrificial animals that they had brought to the temple. As you know, Galilee was a different region up in the north, and they were known, the Galileans were known for their insurrections and for being possibly you know, revolting at times to revolt against Rome. And so Pilate, it seems, was worried about perhaps a revolt or a mob, and so he massacred them. Well, how does the Lord respond to this? He says to the people, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were greater sinners than all the other Galileans? Because that was the mentality in those days that if let's say you experience suffering, or let's say uh, if you were blind or paralyzed or had leprosy, well, maybe it was because of your sinfulness. Remember with the man who was born blind, the apostle said to Jesus, Lord, was it his sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be born blind? And Jesus says, neither one. God allowed it to bring about a greater good, and Jesus would cure him and give glory to his heavenly Father. So in the gospel, Jesus says that these Galileans who were massacred were not greater sinners than other Galileans. But then Jesus does say, I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. So the Lord is telling the people not to be judgmental and try to figure out why these people were killed and others weren't. But instead, use it as a wake-up call for yourself. Make sure that you yourself have repented. Make sure that you yourself are in the spiritual place you should be because we will all die, Jesus says. We will all perish. And we know that the word repent in the original Greek, we get the word metanoia, which is a word that means a change of mind, a change of heart, and the transformation by God's grace. It's really being renewed by the grace of God. That's what repentance is, turning away from sin and turning towards God, beginning a new life, getting on the right path to heaven. Instead of going on a sinful path to hell, you have a conversion, a repentance, a transformation, a metanoia, so you start going in the right direction. So Jesus says, unless you all repent, you will all perish. 
Now then, after this example, the Lord brings up his own example of a recent tragedy that occurred in Jerusalem, and that was when a tower collapsed and killed 18 people, perhaps 18 of the workers, we don't know, but it occurred in Jerusalem because we know where the pool of Siloam was. It was right in the heart of Jerusalem. And so most likely this was one of the aqueducts, one of the towers of the aqueduct that collapsed either because of an earthquake or faulty construction and certain people were killed. And how does the Lord use this tragic event? Do you think that these 18 were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? Why were they singled out? He, Jesus says, by no means. These 18 were no more sinful than anybody else in Jerusalem. But then Jesus again says, but I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. Now, obviously, this is not the most popular saying of Jesus. You never see this on bumper stickers. You always see John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, and that's a wonderful verse. But this is a call to repentance, and this is something that's always in the Bible. All the prophets called people to repentance. Jonah called the people of Nineveh to repentance. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all the prophets called people to conversion of heart, to repentance, to transformation. And when John the Baptist came on the scene, that was his first message, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the very first thing Jesus said when he began his public ministry was, repent for the kingdom of God is among you. So that's what, if you had to boil down the readings from today to one word, it would be repent. And that is the theme of the third Sunday of Lent, is the call to conversion and the call to repentance. And it's, it's really getting back to the basics. As you know, all the readings of Lent are about things like prayer and works of mercy and almsgiving and repentance. And then the gospel concludes by Jesus giving a parable about, again, the importance of producing the fruit of repentance. And he uses the parable of a fig tree. Now, I'm, I'm blessed to know something about fig trees because I inherited two of them at the rectory from Father Nicholas. There are, we have two wonderful fruit trees, uh, fig trees, and I know what the Lord is talking about, that if I went out year after year and it was not producing any figs, well, either you have to cut it down and plant something else there because the fig tree is just exhausting the soil, using up the nutrition from the soil, but not producing any fruit, or you give it special care and you prune it, you fertilize it, you water it, and that's what happens in the gospel. The owner of the vineyard says, I've come out here for three years looking for fruit and have found none. Well, the gardener says, give me one more year. This is the mercy of God. And this is Jesus, the Messiah, saying that, yes, I have one more year. In fact, this event occurred about a year before the Lord's crucifixion. So this occurred with, when the Lord had one more year to work among his people to try to get them to conversion and to repentance because that's what Jesus wants. He is the mercy of the Father. And Jesus wants people to convert and to repent so that we might not perish eternally. And of course, the Lord is referring, of course, to eternal perishing because all of us, we know we're going to die. And when we hear of current events, of tragedies where some people are suddenly killed or tragically killed, we pray for them and it should be a reminder and a wake up call for ourselves that unless we repent, we will also, of course, perish. But the good news is, is that God is merciful and God is patient. But there will be a time when we will die. And while we're alive, we have the opportunity for conversion and repentance. So I recommend go to confession regularly, go to confession frequently. We have a penance service coming up in about a week or so. We'll have two different penance services Come and make a good confession. Receive Jesus in communion as often as you can and remain in the state of grace. One author once said that really your only duty in life is to remain in the state of grace. That is your only duty in your whole life is to always remain in friendship with God in the state of sanctifying grace. Because if you're in a state of grace and if you die, you'll go to heaven. 
We may have to experience some more purification and purgatory, but you will be saved if you die in the state of grace. So that's what the gospel is about, the call to conversion and repentance and the metanoia, the change of mind and heart, the transformation of our lives by the grace of God. And let us